Hey, this is John Quelch, Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School, and welcome to this uh, Herbert Half Hour with uh, uh, our Mayor, Mayor Francis Suarez. And uh, to introduce the Mayor today, uh, we're honored to have uh, the Provost of the University of Miami, uh, Jeff Dirk. Uh, Jeff, please go ahead. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, John, for the introduction, and thank all of you for being here this afternoon. It's, it's my pleasure to welcome our special guest today, the mayor of the city of Miami, Francis Suarez. And as we all know, Mayor Suarez has been working on an inciting a tech boom in Miami that will position the city at the forefront of innovation and the tech industry for years to, go, to come. And Mr. Mayor, I think you remember, it was almost three years ago, March 2nd, 2018, when we met in your office and you shared with me some of your concepts in this space. And I just wanna congratulate you both on your vision and your tenacity for ensuring that Miami emerges in this important uh, technical area, this important economic area, and really to ensure that we have impact in this space. We're delighted to have the mayor with us today to further discuss his vision. As Miami grows into a tech hub, innovation as well as recruiting and retaining the best talent is essential. And Mr. Mayor, University of Miami is ready and able to provide the technological innovation and high caliber talent to support your vision. Welcome everyone, Mayor Francis Suarez. Thank you so much, Dean. Appreciate the warm uh, introduction. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Uh, so first question, uh, Mr. Mayor, and if uh, our audience members have questions, please send them in via the Q&A function. But uh, uh, why do you think uh, now is Miami's moment? Well, I think uh, there is, uh, thank you, John, as well, for the invitation for this panel, which, which according to you is, is subscribed by a very, very high audience of people. And I want to thank you all for watching this. And Miami is the beneficiary of a confluence of macro factors that are conspiring in this moment to give us a, in my opinion, a generational tectonic shift of an opportunity. And what those macro factors are, are you know, the federal government taking away the salt deduction from federal income taxes, which created a, a first wave of migration. You had cities and, and states that were increasing taxes to level where the marginal um, incentive to produce is diminished more and more and people don't feel like they wanna give more money to government. And you had governments which frankly were pushing out their innovators and creators uh, by being antagonistic and hostile to them. Um, we presented a different option. We presented an option of low taxes, um, low crime, low homelessness, high quality of life, and, and frankly, um, an inviting climate to people who wanted to create the jobs and the companies of tomorrow, high paying jobs so that people can not only provide for their families, but they can create jobs for others that provide for their families, which has a generational impact on communities. Uh, we're blessed because we're getting from two macro markets of New York and Silicon Valley and the convergence of those two markets that were always segregated in different parts of the United States and polar opposite sides are now converging in a city and the, what, it, what develops out of that, what's created out of that, the companies that are created out of that, no one knows because there's never been that kind of confluence of capital, that economic freedom uh, in, in one city in, in the history of humanity. So my view, and I see it very clearly, is that Miami will become the capital of capital. We are gonna be the best place in, in America and the best place in the world where someone can create a company, can get uh, funding for it, and can develop it into uh, the company of tomorrow. That's my goal, that's my vision, and that's where I think we're headed. Uh, when you talk about uh, Manhattan meeting Silicon Valley, uh, would it be fair to say that the Silicon Valley part of it is the more challenging of the two? And what kind of, what kind of uh, pushback or reservations do uh, high-tech folks in the Valley uh, offer you when you make the proposition? I think they both have their challenges and they're both of their challenges frankly surround the same issue which is education and talent which is why i'm grateful that you're doing this uh seminar and that your step that um university of miami is stepping up because i think the the issue that keeps resonating is are the schools you know particularly the high schools and and and, and elementary schools are they good schools are there enough schools for the people that are coming and the second piece of it is 
are are the are you are we producing the kind of high level finance and engineering talent that is needed for these kinds of jobs? Now, when I was young, uh, I'm 43 now. When I was in my 20s, a lot of my friends who wanted to get an Ivy League caliber education left Miami, and many of them unfortunately didn't come back because those high paying jobs and those careers were not available to them. And we want to change that dynamic. We want to change that by strengthening our own educational institutions. And I, I'm excited about the gift that the Knight Foundation gave to the University of Miami. They gave one to uh, for you know their Data Sciences Center. They gave one to uh, FIU uh, for their STEM Center, and and one and 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 what the investment that micro uh, that uh, IBM made in Miami Dade Community College by by uh, in artificial intelligence. So you've had you've had in the last six months not only has the tech and finance sector migrated, but you've had the philanthropic community of Miami really rally around this issue and start to put real resources to make us more and more competitive. And I think that's something that is special and needed. And frankly, we need more of it. So my, my, uh, my pitch to this community is we need you to step up now. Now is the time to invest in our education and university system. So we can create the best talent to the extent that there's any uh, you know, perceived reputational issues between or gaps between our university system and those of those Ivy League caliber schools, we want to narrow that gap tomorrow. And we want to, the only way to do that is by attracting high level professors, continuing to get the best talent in the door, investing in our infrastructure, our labs, our, our biotech, uh, so that we have a, a, a premier, the premier institutions of America. If you think about uh, other cities around the world, Mayor, um, which cities do you admire? Are there any that you would benchmark uh, your vision for Miami against? I think what's happening is uh, it's not just a generational opportunity tectonic shift for Miami. It is a, 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 uh, a change in the way that our world operates. And then what's, what, for example, Miami used to be known as the, as the capital of Latin America or has been known as the capital of Latin America. And certainly we are, there's no doubt about it. But I think we're much more than that. And I think in some cases, we sell ourselves short by just settling for that moniker. We are now a truly global city. We are one of uh, a few uh, truly great global cities in the world. And I think what we're going to see in the coming uh, years and the next generation is the best talent and the best companies are going to migrate to these massive global centers, right? Tokyo, um, uh, you know, Tel Aviv, Miami, Doha, or Dubai. Right, it's these these Shanghai. These are, they're going to be these large global cities where innovation and capital is going to migrate, and where people will create, and that creation of those technologies will be exported to the and scaled and to the rest of the world. That's what I see happening, and I think Miami is well positioned to be one of those global cities. Could you comment on the uh, SoftBank uh, deal in particular? How did that come about? Uh, what are the opportunities that it presents to uh, all of us on this webinar? The SoftBank deal was was really critical. It was a watershed moment because after the how can I help tweet, we needed something that could make the quote unquote hype real, right? The hype that I was announcing and that I continued to highlight, we needed something to make it more substantive. And so what SoftBank did was they came and they were the first organization said, we're going to put $100 million of our resources into this Miami initiative for companies that are built in Miami or that moved to Miami. They've already started, started funding companies. They've gotten hundreds, if not thousands of applications. And what was very cool about it was Marcelo uh, Claude, who's uh, you know the CEO of SoftBank and will eventually be the CEO and his incredible team. They have an amazing team here in Miami at 600 Brickle and they're gonna grow. Uh, what was incredible was he came to me recently and he said, look, I just wanna be honest with you. The 100 million was just a number we came up with. The real truth is there is no limit uh, to what we're willing to invest because we have to deploy a to South, we have to deploy a billion dollars of capital a week. They deploy a billion dollars of capital a week. They're a three hundred billion dollar fund. So he said, "Look, if you create good companies, we will fund them. We have absolutely no pipeline shortages. So and and they're the largest hedge fund um, or or VC fund in the world, a three hundred billion dollar fund. So I think the the credibility of and their size." They're bet on Miami. It was an important moment to take this from, from, uh, from hype, if you will, or from, from excitement to reality. If you uh, think about various sectors for a moment, um, FinTech, health tech, um, 
technology related to uh, the environment. Um, are there particular sectors where you think that uh, Miami's chances technology wise are better than others? Well, you know, it's like you're reading my talking points uh, or, or you're reading uh, our, our, our sort of our working group, Miami, uh, our venture Miami team and its work with BCG, Boston Consulting Group. We've actually identified those exact three verticals as what we call right to win verticals. So we think biotech, uh, we think uh, clean energy tech, and we think fintech and crypto are three areas where Miami specifically has a legitimate right uh, to come out as a, as a world leader, right? Biotech, because we have one of the largest healthcare systems in the world. Uh, we have uh, universities that have focused a lot on cancer research uh, and, and a variety of different health-related issues. Um, and so we think biotech is, is a natural. Uh, we, we, um, we obviously think fintech with the crypto is something that the city of Miami has taken a forward position on. And, and we think that we already have a, a very robust financial sector. So in involving the technology uh, um, innovation economy, which frankly is just a subset of every economy, is a natural fit for us. And then, of course, on clean tech, first of all, it's a relatively um, untapped market, if you will. And I think uh, what's exciting about it is, you know, obviously we're the epicenter in many ways for, for climate change and for adaptation in the country. And I've, I've been blessed to be the chair of the Environment Committee for the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And now I'm the only uh, member, the only U.S. mayor that's on the Global Council on Adaptation. I'm the vice chair. There's only one other mayor in the world, which is the mayor of, uh, of Paris and Hidalgo. So we have a, a global leadership position. And I've spoken to the president about this as well. And the president has said, we're going to look to you, like pointing at me, we're going to look to you for climate solutions. Um, and so we have a, an opportunity to be a global leader and to lead on this issue and create the kinds of technology that are going to allow us to adapt and mitigate and reverse the effects of climate change like no other city in America. Or in, in the world, or, for that in, thanks. In order to uh, make the vision happen, are there regulatory changes that uh, would aid and abet the vision that are perhaps uh, in the scope of uh, agencies or uh, levels of government uh, outside of the mayor's office? And how do, oh, we yeah. make, how, how do we make those changes occur in Tallahassee there's, or wherever? There's one right now, there's a bill right now that'll make us the most crypto friendly uh, state in the nation. Um, that is hopefully going to pass in Tallahassee. It's passed, I think, all the House committees, and I think it's got one more in the Senate. Um, so I, I, there is, there's, you know, we need to support uh, those House and Senate bills um, and, and make sure that they, they cross the finish line. And then we need to innovate more, right? Because the thing about the legislature is it only meets once a year for two months. And so there's a 10-month off season for a two-month season. So um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit complicated because, you only get one bite at the apple for a whole year in two months. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to be focused. You have to have the right sponsors and hopefully uh, it, it works out. You know, a, a common analogy uh, to what you're trying to do is uh, fly the plane and change the engine at the same time. Um, what about all of the, uh, the, the basic elements associated with living in Miami and thinking in terms of, uh, transportation and so on. Obviously, there are other jurisdictions that come into play here. Sure. But for the vision to be achieved, there are, there are certain improvements that have to be made, uh, perhaps not just in the schools, but in other areas of public services. No doubt. And I, and I have a different analogy. My analogy is it's like, like turning a cruise ship. I don't know if you have ever witnessed, you know, at the end of the port when they actually turn the cruise ships around, you know, change the reputation of a city it's like turning a cruise ship. And so what I've done is I've hired every available tugboat <laughs> to turn it as fast as humanly possible. <laughs> so that's sort of the, that's the analogy that I use. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's uh, there, there are other challenges, right? And, and there are challenges that were here pre this moment. What I think what's exciting is that this moment, I think, has catalyzed a new way of thinking. And it's almost like a generational shift. Because what I've seen just in this, in the last six months, in terms of, for example, um, transportation, innovation is dramatically and radically different than what I saw the 11 years prior, dramatically, in urban air mobility, in underground tunneling, in hydrofoil uh, uh, planes, uh, seaplanes. 
So you, you've got, you know, three different areas of, 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 uh, of transportation technology, for example, that were never even discussed. So what this has done is it's allowed us to dream. It's allowed us to innovate. It's made us the hub for innovation. So what's happening is all these companies I want to innovate think, and they see Miami and say, we want to start here. And that's, that never happened before. And so now we're going to be the bastion of innovation uh, in the country. And that will allow our citizens to have a better quality of life faster. Thanks. Uh, so we're, we're going to switch uh, to some uh, questions from folks on the webinar. Uh, a couple of people are asking about uh, the affordability of housing in Miami and the implication for their ability to uh, um, earn enough to uh, live in a decent home if uh, there's a uh, if this vision is achieved. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you got to understand first and foremost. So let me take the income side. If the vision is achieved, then what we've accomplished is creating thousands and thousands of high paying jobs. So when you create high paying jobs, you do not have an affordability issue because by definition, you have people that have the ability to afford the places and don't need to live in, for example, affordable housing. But when you look at affordable housing and you look at market rate housing in the city, first let's look at market rate housing. In downtown Miami right now, a brand new building, unsubsidized, meaning there's no you know, city money or county money. There's no federal, there's no subsidy at all. You can get a one bedroom apartment in downtown in the urban core for $1,450. $1,450, brand new, unsubsidized. If you try to do that in, uh, in, in LA, in San Francisco and in New York, it's three times that amount. So the cost differential is enormously in our favor. To that, you add the fact that our bond, we have $100 million in, in funds for affordable housing through Miami Forever. We've taken 10 million of that. We've already leveraged it at a 20 to one rate. So we've gotten $200 million worth of projects for $10 million worth of funds. We've gotten 722 units. At that rate, we would get 7,200 more units of affordable housing. So, you know, I've spent my entire career focused on the 11 years of it, focused on housing and transit on the, what I call the expense side of the equation. And for the first time in my career for a year, I'm focusing on the income side of the equation. I'm focusing on creating jobs. I'm focusing on creating careers because what that does is that it, it solves the other ones in many ways. You don't need affordable housing if you have a high paying job. You don't need necessarily mass transit if you can afford to live a block away from your work or close to your work. So we need to redesign our cities and rethink our cities. But part of it is not always hyper-focusing on the expenses and, and, so, and now focusing on how do we build careers? How do we build people up? So that Miami and every Miami and every single one is competitive and compete in a modern day economy. Um, also, in uh, the spirit of sustainability, uh, someone here is asking about uh, ocean rise. Um, what are the uh, uh, new mitigation efforts that are going to be put in place in that regard to uh, prevent uh, Miami's global city competitors from um, essentially uh, undermining Miami's uh, vision by, by pointing to this uh, uh, real and present danger? Well, they're, they're going to do it regardless. <laughs> they're going to, they're always going to, that's going to be one of the, the more prevalent, what I call counter brands on Miami, which is Miami's going to be underwater in 50 years. Miami's going to, I've heard, by the way, I've heard a variety of different targets of when we're going to be underwater, as, as dramatic as we're going to be underwater in 10 years, we're going to be underwater in 50 years, in 100 years, whatever, 200 years. So uh, look, it's a counter brand that we have to deal with. And the only way to deal with that is to recognize the problem, is to recognize the problem, is to accept the problem, and is to confront the problem, right? So what do we do? We as a community did something very unusual. We voted to tax ourselves to the tune of $400 million, 200 million of which is for climate resiliency, right? We now have a brand new updated stormwater master plan that was eight years, uh, nine years outdated. Uh, thanks to the Republican state legislature. And I'm not saying the party, just I'm just saying it because it's a kind of counter brand, right? Um, and, and so that's wonderful that we have that. Uh, we have our climate mitigation plan, which is our carbon neutrality plan so that we can be a leader in, in, in not further damaging our environment. And, and we're gonna create the kind of, and then we have the back base study, which is going through its final process of approval with the Army Corps of Engineers, which will create a $7 billion buffer system for hurricane storm surge. So we have uh, redesigned a, a plan for the future of Miami that will give, make us hurricane proof on the water side. We've, we're already hurricane proof on the wind side since Hurricane Andrew. 
It will make us water resilient for more, more greater than annual rainfalls. And, and, and by the way, we also have to recognize, you know, people are, are, are understandably afraid of this subject and this topic in terms of it, how it affects our, our viability. But, but understand this, you know, places like the Netherlands have, you know, survived under sea level for hundreds of years. So this idea that just because you're below sea level, you're, you're out of existence is, 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 is inaccurate. I mean, it's inaccurate in terms of, of, of what uh, other, other cities and countries have, have experienced. Now, that doesn't mean we should get there. It doesn't mean that we should do nothing to prevent us from getting there. I'm just saying that it's not as doomsday as people say. It, it certainly is not a great scenario to go from six feet above sea level to go to six feet below sea level. It's not something that we want, um, but you know, it's not as, as it's it's not as as a, a cataclysmic as people say sometimes. Okay. Uh, question: um, How do you manage the relationship between the city of Miami, Miami Dade County, and the state? And then a second question, which I think is a little bit more fun: uh, How do you spend your time during an average day? Well, the first question is. Uh, I, I could tell a, an off-color and funny joke, but I'm not going to do it. Um, I'll just say that we, I manage those relationships very carefully, um, and and it's and it's and and they're, they can be very difficult relationships because uh, oftentimes there's inconsistency of, of thought, there's inconsistency of of, uh, of ideas and how to solve problems, and so and then there's overlapping jurisdiction, which makes it very complicated. And, and there we we often butt heads because. I feel like I know what's best for my residents and people who are above me in, in, in a sense, you know, the mayor uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the governor also feel that same way. So, you know, that, that could create, that does create oftentimes conflict. How do I spend my day normally? I mean, I, I usually work 14 hours a day. <laughs> so uh, I, I try to get as much time in with my family on the weekends in particular. So my weekends are somewhat uh, sacrosanct Right, somewhat, uh, uh, you know, and, and I so I try to keep them as clear as I possibly can, but uh, but listen, being a mayor of a big city is is complex. It's it's difficult. It's a it's a you know we're running a billion dollar company with forty five hundred employees and four labor unions and all of the international problems that you can imagine. So anything anytime anything happens, I'm getting a call. I need to react. I need to you know. Uh, so it's 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 all consuming. Someone is asking about the degree to which uh, you um, represent um, the interests of underrepresented non-Hispanic minorities when you are courting um, companies that are thinking of coming here. How well, that's exactly what is that? That's exactly what I'm representing because we have a brand that's not just called Miami Forever. It's called Miami for Everyone. And if we really believe in trying to empower every one of our citizens, then what we need to do is make sure that they have equal op opportunity to be successful, not equal outcome, because that, that is something that's a different philosophy that we don't subscribe to, but an equal opportunity to be successful. And so I was very honored to participate in an initiative called Miami Connect that was led by Ken Griffin and the Miami Foundation and Access Miami, where Ken Griffin gave a $5 million gift. We all gave uh, some sort of matching contributions so that every child on free and reduced lunch, every child in Miami-Dade County, 100,000 kids could have free broadband access for two years. The digital divide is a very real um, class stratification problem. And our obligation as public policymakers is to give every child in our, in our community a real opportunity to be successful. And you need to do that through connectivity. You need to do that through digital tools, which I'm trying to find a philanthropist that will donate on the digital tool side, and you need to do that uh, through curriculum. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, curriculum is very important uh, because that's what teaches the kids how to be successful in that economy. Uh, for all the emphasis on uh, technology, a tremendous amount of Miami's uh, income depends on the hospitality industry, very to find uh, retail, logistics. What? You're still focusing, obviously, on these core industries that have uh, been uh, the bread and butter of Miami up to now. We have to diversify. Anyone who invests in anything will tell you that a diverse portfolio is the most resilient portfolio. Because if something happens like a pandemic and you have your cruise industry, which is completely shut down for over a year, 
you have to be able to survive as a community. If you're completely relying on that industry for employment and for economic activity, you're in trouble. And, you know, the most, I think, all encompassing uh, uh, industry right now and in the future is going to be technology. Technology literally is a subcomponent of every industry and it touches every industry. So the beauty of it is if you have a robust, what I call knowledge-based economy, uh, you're going to have an opportunity uh, to always be diversified, to always uh, be robust and always be resilient whenever there's economic shocks. What's the best way of staying in touch with your initiative in the tech area? I think it's to follow my Twitter, which is at Francis Suarez. Um, follow my Instagram at, at Miami Mayor um, or at Mayor of Miami. Um, and, and, uh, and, and also watch my Cafecito Tech Talks. What, what I try to do, right. it's sort of a, similar to this, you know, sort of a long form interview. Uh, with the people who are coming to this community, uh, whether they be, you know, and the people who are here, who are innovating in this community. So that's what they're about. We've had amazing guests. We, we, we had one podcast that if you combine the amount of time that people viewed it, everybody who viewed it, they viewed it for three, over three years worth of, of, of views of, of the video. So I, I think we are um, highlighting and telling our story. And what's been great about this, um, uh, one of the good things about the, the pandemic is the fact that all these webinars and all these, you know, they've all, you know, they've all been born out of this. Right. And, and it's very easy. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm in a car in, in Orlando. I should be back later today. I mean, you know, and, and I can do this from there and, and, and you guys are where you're at and there's complete and utter uh, ubiquity in terms of the access to this, webinar and we're, we're we got a great audience from what they tell me it's almost double the number of subscriptions that they normally have so it's exciting to be able to have a portal of communication um and, and be able to get a message out yeah we had uh, over uh, 570 people registered for uh, uh this webinar so tremendous interest in uh, in what you're doing what's the biggest surprise in this technology quest this past year can you think of one thing that was Really, really an amazing surprise. There's been so many. I mean, the people, if you would have told me on December 3rd, the day before my tweet went out of how can I help, that the next day I was going to send out a tweet that was going to be seen by 2.7 million people, right? And then that was going to, that was going to uh, be the impetus for me to tweet 800 more times in December. And that those tweets were going to be seen by 27 million people, right? Organically. And that I was going to, uh, be, uh, you know, talk to, Jack Dorsey, and that I was going to talk to uh, Elon Musk, and that I was going to talk to uh, the Winklevoss twins that helped create Facebook, and that I was going to talk to, um, you know, uh, uh, Fred Ersham and 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 uh, Brian Armstrong from Coinbase, uh, and and Kevin O'Leary, and 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 you know Kevin McCarthy and Nikki Haley, and all the people that have come through uh, David Port, everyone who's come through our office. If you were to tell me that uh, you know that that was going to happen to me, I would have told you there's no way. I mean, there's no way that you can create a world where all of these things are going to collide and that Miami is going to go from relative obscurity in tech to being the most talked about city in America and in the world in tech in six months. I would have told you you were crazy. All right. We're running out of time here, but uh, uh, I think everybody on this call knows you're a Panther. We know you're a Gator, but uh, what about the, uh, what about the H? You know, I, I, I was telling you offline that, uh, I was born in, in Miami. I'm the first mayor of Miami, born in Miami. My father was mayor from 1985 to 1993. So uh, we were, he was mayor when they won three national championships. Um, so, I, you know, it, it's impossible for a Miami-born guy not to be in many ways a hurricane at heart, uh, you know, deep down inside. So that's, uh, that, that's who I am. And, and hopefully um, they'll start winning some more championships so I can have bragging rights with my father. I was telling the mayor earlier that we've had even MBA applicants in the last couple of months uh, telling our recruiters that they're interested in the University of Miami Herbert Business School because of what the mayor has been doing and saying in terms of turning, uh, turning this into a great technology hub. Uh, I want to thank the provost for joining us. We're out of time. Uh, appreciate everybody's attendance and uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for all you're doing for us. Good luck and whatever we can do to help, we're here. Thank you, John. And that, that last bit that you share with the audience means the world to me because that is real. And that is 
what all this energy and all this effort has been about. It's about creating opportunities, not just for the university, but for the economy, our economy, and for the people that are going to be creating these jobs and having these jobs and making Miami the most successful city in the world. Thank you. And Thank you. good afternoon from uh, Miami Herbert Business School. Have a great day. You too.